Hey guys, this review focuses on Key Concept 3.3, the problems of industrialization provoked a range of ideological, governmental, and collective responses. Essentially, it's going to focus on the ideologies that develop what we call the isms of the 19th century. These ideologies developed and took root throughout society as a response to industrial and political revolutions. Keep in mind the Industrial Revolution of the late 18th and 19th centuries, as well as the political revolutions in both 18, during the early 1800s, so the French Revolution, the revolutions of 1830, and the revolutions of 1848. And the ideas that come will be liberalism, radicalism and republicanism, conservatism, socialism, communism, anarchism, nationalism, and Zionism. Liberalism is the belief in the legitimate freedom of the individual and in the tendency of authority to corrupt. And essentially the tenets of liberalism demand representative government, equality before the law, and individual freedom such as freedom of speech and of assembly. And throughout the 19th century, liberalism became an increasingly middle-class doctrine. It was often used to exclude the lower classes from government. Um, and, you know, as a as a whole, what we'll see with liberalism is the fact that, you know, as this doctrine goes forward, as the century goes on, it becomes more of a movement for universal male suffrage. So early on, taking the ideas of the enlightened philosophers, liberalism expanded, but they felt that it was more of a middle class doctrine, that the, those who are uneducated should not be a part of it. Two names to associate with liberalism are John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham. And John Stuart Mill is pretty much the leading spokesperson for classical liberalism. You know, he, you know, focused on these ideas that we previously discussed. And not only did he advance individual rights, but he was one of the few of his time period to advance women's rights as well. Jeremy Bentham's principle of liberal utilitarianism is a component of liberalism. And essentially what this accepts is the need for government intervention in social life, but it also argues that the natural principles of human behavior for example, the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people, and that should be the ultimate governors of human behavior. Interestingly, Mill rejected this argument, the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. He felt that government should protect those individual rights and that the idea of individual rights, uh, such as in our constitution, actually prote project, protects the minority and protect, protects minority opinions. Evolving from the idea of liberalism are the ideas of the radicals and the republicans. Radicals in Great Britain and republicans on the continent prior to 1850 made demands such as universal male suffrage and full citizenship, full citizenship without regards to property ownership. Some also argued that such rights should be extended to women. And I would advise you to pick uh, either John Stuart Mill or Flora Tristan from that period and do a SCAR ID on, these, on either of those people as examples of those that advocated for rights for women. In addition, another movement developed during this time known as the Chartist Movement, and this movement developed in Britain. In general, there were several undemocratic features about the British government. There was an unfair distribution of seats in the House and Commons, what we call rotten and pocket boroughs. There were restrictions on voting um, and domination of upper class oligarchies in local areas. However, in 1832, the Great Reform Bill was passed, which basically increased political representation and enfranchised about half of the British middle class. Still, that was only one in, out of every 32 adult males that were able to vote. The House of Commons emerged as a major legislative body, and at that point, we're going to see even greater demands. And a movement that evolved by the late 1830s in response to this was, were the Chartist movement. The Chartists passed around two petitions, each gathering over a million signatures, demanding universal male suffrage and the introduction of a secret ballot. Although both of those movements failed, although both of those movements failed, they did eventually, even after the Chartists disbanded, their ideas eventually became reality by the late 19th century in Britain. Another movement that developed during this time period that countered the development of liberalism was the movement known as conservatism. Conservatives in general 
underline the importance of tradition, of traditional values, the church, the monarchy, and wanted to maintain these traditions, wanted to maintain this hereditary monarchy and keep order in a society that often did not have order. One of the leading spokespersons, Edmund Burke, wrote Reflections on the Revolution in France, and his belief was that in the benefits of gradual change. Once again, he, as any traditional conservative, he believed in the importance of a stable social order, and he argued that rapid change in society brings about violence and disorder as represented during the time of the reign of terror during the French Revolutionary period. Conservatism was also epitomized by Prince Clemens von Metternich, the chief minister of the Austrian Empire. And he was probably even more reactionary than Burke. He was opposed to both liberalism and nationalism. And in fact, in 1819, he issued the Carlsbad Decree, which imposed censorship and espionage to regulate liberal and nationalistic ideology and activity. Keep in mind, in the Austrian Empire, nationalism was an even greater threat than liberalism because of the multicultural character of the empire. There, while the Germans ruled the empire, there was also significant subject minorities that included Hungarians, Italians, and various Slavic groups. Another of the isms of this period is that of utopian socialism. And utopian socialists generally called for a fair distribution of society's resources and wealth. And, you know, eventually evolved from utopian socialism to a Marxist scientific critique. And so when we talk about utopian socialism, French utopian socialists proposed a system of greater economic equality that was planned by the government. They believed that the rich and poor should be more nearly equal economically and that private property should be abolished. And once again, there are several people you could choose, um, either Henry saint Simon, Pierre Proudhon, or Charles Fourier as your example. Uh, I personally uh, think Charles Fourier is probably the most interesting. He envisioned a utopian society where people would work and live together in harmony in communes. He also criticized the middle class family life. He criticized marriage customs and actually supported um, different freedoms within a marriage that went against the tradition of society during this time period. Another example of a socialist that was not quite as extreme as Charles Fourier was Louis Blanc. And Louis Blanc believed that the state should set up government-backed workshops and factories to guarantee employment and a basic wage. Unlike others, he did believe in a democratic government and the ideas of democratic socialism will continue to evolve well into the 20th century. And the most radical of the socialist movements, that of Marxist socialism or communism, where the ideas were best expressed was known as the Communist Manifesto. Overall, Karl Marx was preoccupied with the social injustice that attended the growth of industrial capitalism. And Marx saw all previous history in terms of an economic class structure. Going back to the medieval ages, it would have been serf versus lord. And the society he lived in, the Western industrialized society, the two sides essentially were proletariats or the working class versus the business owners slash capitalists slash industrialists. Yeah. Marx believed that industrial society was characterized by the exploitation of the proletariat, by the bourgeoisie, by the capitalists, and that labor and property were the central structural device of human existence and a worker was defined by his or her labor and labor was the source of all wealth. And once again, according to Max, laborers were unfairly exploited by the bourgeoisie, by the capitalists. Overall, this critique of capitalism um, included also a critique of religion. Max, Marx believed that religion was the opiate of the masses and we will later see communist ideologies accept the values of atheism and most communist countries will eliminate religion within their countries or try to eliminate religion. As far as the philosophy behind communism, there was Marx predicted that the future would bring a violent revolution by workers that would overthrow the capitalists. And this violent revolution, you know, would ultimately lead to a society where everybody was equal, this utopia in many sense, and that ultimately 
communist philosophy stressed the idea that government would not be necessary when true equality existed, something we know never quite happened or not happened the way Marx envisioned it. But the impact was pretty profound. We're going to see the rapid growth of both socialist and communist parties in the second part of the century. Um, socialists actually united to form an international organization known as the First International in 1864. And although this it didn't really last, it was very short-lived, it had a great psychological impact when all was said and done. Another movement that developed in the second half of the 19th century and a much more radical movement was that of anarchism, best represented by the ideas of Mikhail Bakunin. Bakunin was a Russian nobleman and became the most influential of the anarchists. And in general, anarchists asserted that all forms of governmental authority were unnecessary and should be overthrown and replaced with a society based on voluntary cooperation. This was kind of a spinoff of the mainstream and radical socialist movements. And they essentially sought to destroy the centralized state. Um, anarchy was probably strongest in Spain and Italy, and it became very trendy in Russia for noblemen to study this, to study anarchism and become uh, adherents to its philosophy. And political assassinations by anarchists shook the political world with the deaths of six national leaders between 1881 and 1901, including Alexander II of Russia, and President William McKinley of the United States, as well as King Umberto I of Italy in 1900. <coughs> Another very predominant ism that not only developed throughout the 19th century, but continues throughout the 21st century and has had somewhat of a revival since 1989 and the fall of the Iron Curtain is that of nationalism. And nationalism basically became perhaps the greatest force for revolution in the period between the Congress of Vienna and 1850. Uh, it romanticized a united people fighting against the absolutism of kings and the tyranny of foreign oppressors. And ultimately, most nationalists embraced the ideas of liberalism doing so. Uh, they, they felt that liberal ideas and liberal reform should be a part of it. Many nationalists wanted to politically unify their countries as evidenced um, in Germany and Italy during this time period. In fact, the Italians revolted against Austrian rule in 1830 and again in 1848. And a revolution in Prussia in 1848 resulted in a failed attempt to unify Germany. But it also tore apart some countries, such as the Austrian Empire, Nationalist revolts by the Hungarians and Bohemians threatened the stability of the empire. Another example that was used during this time period of nationalism is that of the idea that of Greece. And Greece gained its independence from the Ottoman Empire sometime around 1830. The Greek movement began in 1821, and we're going to see several romantic poets and philosophers of the period openly support the Greeks, the, the cradle of democracy, in their fight against the Ottomans for unification, and were so influential that it went against the ideas of the contra to Europe. However, when Greece was created, a German king was put on the throne, and although Greece, the Romantics may have emphasized that Greece had been this birthplace of democracy, we are going to see a Greece that is unified, not as a democracy, but as a monarchy. Belgium will win its independence from the Netherlands in 1830, and we'll see revolts from the Poles in 1830 that failed to gain independence from the Russians. Really, the only two major countries that were spared nationalist revolutions during this time period were Britain and Russia. By the second part of the century, we're going to see uh, nationalism develop um, even more, and we're going to see nationalism associated with racialism and anti-Semitism and the ideas of social Darwinism. And as you know, this idea of racial and cultural superiority will continue on throughout the second part of the century as well. And finally, the idea of chauvinism that will develop, once again, justifying national aggrandizement, this idea that as a nation, that nation was superior to other nations' ideals and beliefs that occurred. And this, you know, once again, it coincided with these ideas of social Darwinism and the ideas about European superiority over the rest of the world.
Another form of nationalism, Zionism, or Jewish nationalism, developed in the late 19th century as a response to growing anti-Semitism in Europe during this time period. As a result of social Darwinistic policies, as well as increased nationalism, we're going to see anti-Semitism rage in both Eastern and Western Europe during the late 19th century. Uh, in Russia, we'll see increasing pogroms aimed at the Jewish population. And in Western Europe, we'll see Jews blamed for economic troubles of capitalism and liberalism. And this will contribute to it as well. The most uh, well-noted example of anti-Semitism actually occurred in in Western Europe occurred in France in the 1890s, and that was known as the Dreyfus Affair. The French military falsely charged a Jewish army captain, Alfred Dreyfus, with supplying secrets to the Germans. And monarchists, the Catholic Church, as well as the military used this incident to discredit the Third Republic and those that supported it. At one point, Emile Zola took up Dreyfus's case, um, wrote a newspaper article defending Dreyfus called I Accuse. And in general, this Dreyfus affair really divided France. Leftists supported the Republic, while conservatives in the military and the church were on the other side. Um, the Dreyfus affair uh, was closed in 1906 when he was declared innocent and returned to his military position. But this division in France did not necessarily end the anti-Semitism. Although we'll see an anti-clerical campaign increasing the separation of church and state in a more secular France, Anti-Semitism does not go away as a trouble. And so some Jewish leaders responded to anti-Semitism by embracing this idea of Zionism. Theodor Herzl uh, led this movement uh, that occurred in the prior to the Dreyfus Affair. And this movement itself uh, gained some credit to the establishment of a Jewish homeland in the area known as Palestine. Some Jews argued against Zionism that it resulted in increase in anti-Semitic activities and while the movement kind of goes on for a while, the Balfour Declaration by the British government during World War I will give support to it, the movement really gains full steam after World War II and with the creation of Israel in 1948. Governments often responded to problems created or exacerbated by industrialization by expanding their functions and creating modern bureaucratic states. So we're going to see a shift from laissez-faire to interventionist um, economic and social policies that are going to address the impact of this industrial revolution on the individual. You know, for example, Bismarck's welfare state, um, the growth of the, you know, this, the, the growth of, um, you know, social welfare programs that can help individuals. Uh, furthermore, during this time period, we're going to see the transformation of cities. Um, governments often transformed unhealthy and overcrowded cities by modernizing infrastructure, regulating public health, and reforming prisons as well. And I think we've already talked about the transformation of Paris in the 1860s and the, the growth of that. The Vienna was redone. And we'll see sewage and water systems placed in cities, public lighting, public housings, parks, public transportations in this effort to beautify the cities. One positive side effects of the beautification of cities such as Paris and Vienna was increased public work projects and incre increased employment for the population. Compulsory public, compulsory public education to advance public order, nationalism and economic growth also uh, existed during this time period. And by the end of the 19th century, most of Western Europe has at least compulsory education for elementary school age children. Political movements and Social organizations responded to the problems of industrialization in a variety of ways. We're going to see the creation of mass-based political parties that are going to emerge with universal male suffrage. For example, in Great Britain, the conservatives and liberals, the social democrats in Germany, conservatives and socialists in France. Workers are going to establish labor unions and movements that will develop into political parties. Uh, once again, you know, the British Labor Party, which will emerge at the beginning of the uh, 20th century will become a political party of its own right, uh, as well as a Russian Social Democratic Party. And feminists, you know, press for legal, economic and political rights for women, as well as improved working conditions. This would be best exemplified by the work of the Pankhurst family, in particular, the British Emily, Emmeline Pankhurst and the British Women's Social and Political Union, who called attention to the cause of this. 
and with her daughters became increasingly militant using mass demonstrations, imprisonment, and even violence to achieve full voting rights. After World War I, women in Britain over the age of 30 achieved voting rights, and by 1929, universal suffrage existed in Britain as a result of groups such as the WSPU. And finally, various private non-governmental reform movements sought to lift up the deserving poor and end serfdom and slavery. The British abolitionist movement uh, existed to end slavery and helped to end the slave trade in the early part of the 19th century as well. There were temperance movements uh, that were not quite as successful in Europe, Europe as they were in the United States. And ultimately, you know, these groups to help the deserving poor, which included, you know, women and children and the elderly or those that were unable to work for themselves. Hope you've enjoyed this review. Our next review is the key concept three, four, the 19th century European states, as well as revolutions and revolts during that time period.